and and you knew this whether whether you actually had it stated as the factor theorem before you've actually used this um and your instructor may have put if and only if right in here and what that means is not only is this true the way it's written but it's also true if f of k equals zero then you know that it has a factor of x minus k um I, I was going to go ahead and do an example of this, but I'm going to wait and use both the factor theorem and the remainder theorem together. Um, because you're, in most cases, you're going to use them together. Uh, the uh, remainder theorem. basically says, again, if you have a function f of x, um, and you divide that, I'm just going to write f of x divided by x minus k, The remainder is R. Okay, it has it has some remainder, and of course the remainder could be zero, but whatever the remainder is is the same as f of k. And what I showed you the other day was if you put this in synthetic division and you divide it you know you've got some coefficients going across and you divide out by k if you do the synthetic division and you end up with a remainder of zero that is the value of the function k and I'm kind of getting ahead of myself. Whatever the remainder is. Ah. Whatever that is, that is the same as the value of the function. Okay. Now, if your remainder is zero, it's the same as any time we're dividing and end up with a remainder of zero. If your remainder is zero, then the factor theorem tells you that x minus k is a factor of the original polynomial. So, I think it's going to be easiest to explain these two theorems um, by showing you a couple examples. And um, explaining, explaining them. And we will be using synthetic division. And this is one reason why you had a quiz on synthetic division, because I knew you were going to need it for a lot of the work that you're going to do in the rest of this chat. Um, I have made a video uh, going over the problems on that last quiz. I haven't posted it yet, but it is uploaded to um, YouTube. If you wanted to go to YouTube and search, use my last name, Arco, you probably could find it, um, but I will post it in Blackboard, hopefully today.
Okay. Um, let's look at f of x equals 3x to the third plus, plus 5x minus 7. And we want to know what f negative 2 is. And I want you to go ahead and do the synthetic division. I have to go get a cup of coffee because if you can't hear it, I'm real strange in my voice right now. So I'll be right back. You do the synthetic division. Okay. I'm back now. We're going to put negative 2 on the outside. Our coefficients are 3, 8, 5, and negative 7. Four of those are power 3, so we've got the right number. While talking, I also checked my signs are correct. So bring down the 3. 3 times negative 2 is negative 6. That's 2. That's negative 4. That's negative 2. And that's negative 9. And what the remainder theorem tells me is f of negative 2 is equal to negative 9, which means if you were to substitute negative 9 for all the x's, you, you, I'm sorry, I said that wrong. If you were to substitute negative 2 for all of the x's, you would get negative 9. And hopefully I can do this quickly without making a mistake. Negative 2 to the third power is negative 8 times 3 is negative 24. By the way, what I'm doing right now is just showing you that it you will get the same answer. You do not have to do this part I'm writing in, in red ink because of the remainder theorem. You know that should be true. Um, negative 2 squared is 4 times 8 is 32. Um, 5 times negative 2 is negative 10 and negative 7. Um, this gives first 2 combined gives me 8. 8 minus 10 is negative 2 and negative 2 minus 7 gives me the negative 9. So I did that in, in kind of a fast pace there. Um, 
the synthetic division really is easier and often faster than than trying to plug it in. One thing, you have to make sure that all of your signs are correct when you plug it in. And when we're raising things to powers, um, it's not always going to be easy as it is to do. So, um, synthetic division should work much better. Now, there we use the remainder theorem. Let's look at another problem. Well, it doesn't want to change color. I don't like to do everything in red. But I may have. Another. Okay, our function f of x is 2x to the fourth plus 7x to the third minus 4x squared minus 27x minus 18. Um, and we want to know is x minus 2 I fit it in. Is x minus 2 a factor? And that's a minus. So, Remember, if it's given in the form of a factor, I want to know what x is. Well, we're checking for when x is 2. Our coefficients are 2, 7, negative 4, negative 27, and negative 18. Five numbers, and that's one more than the four. So we've got the right number. Bring down the 2. 2 times 2 is 4. That's 11 times 2 is 22. That's a 18 times 2 is 36. Uh, 27 from 36 is 9. And 9 times 2 is 18. This tells us, first of all, that f of 2 equals 0. And the factor theorem says that if the remainder is, th is 0, or if the function is equal to 0, then x minus 2 is a factor. So what this does, it tells you x minus 2. times, and the numbers we have down here form a polynomial, which is 2x to the third, it's a 3, um, plus 11x squared, plus 18x, plus 9. So, that is a factored form of the original polynomial. Now, the problem in the book actually asks you to do is word it a little bit differently, but, well, not really, because it, it gave you two things. It wanted to know if x minus 2 and x plus 3 were factors. Well, to find out if x plus 3 is a factor, if it's a factor of the original polynomial, after you take out the x minus 2, 
it also has to be a factor of a polynomial remaining. So in order to find out if x plus 3 is a factor, I don't have to go back to the original polynomial. I can use this polynomial, the 2x to the third plus 11x plus 18x plus 9. So I'm going to change colors just so you can see what, I, what I've done. Um, so if x plus 3 is a factor, that means x equals negative 3. So I'm going to see if that's a factor. Bring down the 2. 2 times negative 3 is negative 6. That gives me 5. 5 times negative 3 is negative 15. That gives me 3. 3 times negative 3 is negative 9. And that gives me 0. We in fact, I'm going to block that all the way off. That zero was the remainder that was not part of the remaining polynomial, so I don't have to worry about that. I did end up with another zero for a remainder. And the factor theorem says if I get zero as a remainder, then it is a factor. So I now have, I knew that x minus 2 is a factor. I just showed that x plus 3 is a factor. And it leaves me with 2x squared plus 5x plus 3. OK, I have enough work. I would like you to go ahead and factor that remaining quadrant. And you can factor it using any method that you would like. I would pick whatever works fastest for you. There are supposed to be eight of you out there. Okay, I said to go ahead and factor the 2x squared plus 5x plus 3. Because it's a quadratic, you should be able to do that. I will turn my mind up, but I don't know why it's cutting in and out. That could be... either from your end or something of the connection between here and there. Yes, and I assume you both got the answers without even looking at the other one because they came to me to each other. So if you completely factor that whole original polynomial, you will end up with x minus 2 
times x plus 3 times x plus 1 times 2x plus 3. Now, I'm pretty sure before you started this, you were not able to factor quartic if it's got an x to the fourth, that's what it's called. But anyway, you couldn't factor anything to the fourth power. We also found that x plus 1 was a factor. That means if you put a minus 1 here and do synthetic division one more time, that gives me a 2. 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. That's 3. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3, and that gives me a 0. And I have very little space left, but this 2 and 3 on the bottom here tells you that the remaining factor is 2x plus 3. Um, the, the difficulty here with finding the x plus 1 without just factoring is even using the rational theorem, there are so many different possibilities for this. It might have taken you a while to come up with any of these three. Now, you probably would have tried one or two of them. And remember, once you use synthetic division once and you get down here, it's going to limit your rash roots some. And then once you do synthetic division again, it's going to limit your rash roots some more. So it is helpful if they give you one or two. Um, I'm not sure about your instructors, but often um, an instructor will allow you to graph it on your calculator to find one or two of the solutions. In other words, we might have been able to find two and negative three and then using synthetic vision, we can find the solution. OK. Um, I hope that explains the factor theorem and the rational root theorem. Is there, and I think you told me that, yeah, that was section 3 4. Um, 3 7 is rational functions. Is there anything specific that you would like to go over about rational functions or anything between sections 3 4 and 3 7 that I haven't gone over? Or even if I've gone over it, if you want me to do some more. Okay, no questions. Uh, I haven't looked at the quiz from uh, last week, but hopefully I will find that it was good. Um, I'm thinking for this week, what I might do for your quiz is give you a problem similar to this 
where you can at least get it down to a quadratic, which means I would give you a couple of the solutions and then have you completely factor it. And then I may give you a problem where you have to find maybe domain and horizontal and vertical asymptotes, which is what I'm going to go over now. I'm flipping through both to see where I want to start. Okay. <clears throat> Um, I do encourage all of you, because I was wondering if it was time to go over, but whenever I ask you, tell me you're good at factoring. Um, if there's someone that may still be having difficulty with factoring quadratics, um, I think it's still available. Let me Let me double check this. Oh, my computer's running slow this morning. With many of the things that we're doing right now, it is very important that you can factor. It's difficult to find a domain or a vertical or a horizontal asymptote. Yes, I, I just wanted to check. All of the videos that I've posted are still available. I haven't made any of them unavailable because I thought there may be a time when someone may want to back and look at one of them. It makes the page kind of full, but you can see all of the titles go to the one that you want. If there's any of you, I don't know why I just got a. Um, if any of you need to go back and practice factoring, that video is still up. So I encourage you to go back and look at it. And I know sometimes in a situation like this, you're hesitant to ask a question because you think you're the only person that's having difficulty with it. You're probably not, but you can always go back and look at it. I have not posted office hours yet for this week but i should do that today so um if you're having any difficulties you can always come to my office hours i've had some students in my other classes saying they tried to get in and they couldn't and one student said i ignored him well if i ignored him it's because i didn't know he was in the room um <clears throat> excuse me make sure you use the links that i've I give. If you, I'm rebelling this morning, um, oh, you go into collaborate without using the link. You may be in a room that I'm not in. And that makes it difficult for you to get help. So use the link that I've given you. That allows students from any of my classes to get in. Uh, and when you get in, speak up. I may be on the computer doing something else. If you don't speak up, I might not hear that there's someone in the room. But I do encourage you to come to the office hours if you have any questions about this class or your 171 class. <clears throat> With rational functions, to find the domain, the domain. Well, the domain actually means the denominator
the denominator is the one that's down below or bottom part of the fraction. The denominator cannot be equal to zero. So basically, to find the domain of a rational function, you set the denominator equal to zero and you eliminate um, those values. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. If you, <clears throat> I'm not sure if my voice wants to make it through this class. Um, we're going to start with something fairly easy here. If you have this function, it doesn't matter what the numerator is. The denominator. Between my voice not working and my tongue trying to say weird things, I don't know what's going on this morning. The numerator part on top can be anything. Okay, it can be a fraction, a decimal, a positive, a negative. It can be anything. The denominator cannot be zero. So, if we set the denominator equal to zero. First thing you have to do is factor it. That factors into x plus 1, x minus 1. Once it's in factor form, you set each factor equal to 0. And you get x equals negative 1 and x equals 1. So your domain is all real numbers as long as x is not equal to negative 1 or 1. Now, the instructor may have you write it in a couple different forms. Interval notation. That says rotation. Um, that's where any from now. And we now when you write it in interval and you do have sure that you use Interval notation is what we use most of the time. As the years go, if it's set notation, you have to use the little. And you would simply x is not equal, and in <clears throat> of a symbol here, I plug in my computer, so I just did. okay. That's how you would find. Thank <laughs> you. 
line. The vertical asthmatotes. To find the vertical asthmatotes, um, you actually set each factor, that's an O, of the denominator equal to zero. And you know, the question here is, well, isn't that what we just did? Yes, it is. So on your paper, you wouldn't have erased the work that I erased. So you already show that x couldn't equal one or negative one. So you have a vertical asymptote at x equals negative one and another one at x equals one. Are they asking you to do anything more than that with vertical assessment? I think they may also be asking you for the end behavior. And if they have yet, I think they will. Getting rid of the extra line. Okay, so what we, ah, I didn't mean to erase that. I was going to change the color back. Oh, we were vertical asthmatose. Um, hopefully you got that. Um, we had a vertical asymptote at x equal negative 1 and another one x equal 1. So if we're at negative 1, <coughs> we want to know is it going to infinity or is it going to negative infinity as it approaches negative one? And we need to look at it from both sides, the left side and the right side. And let me get our function back here. Our function was I have to find it. Two x squared. over and we factored it into x plus 1 times x minus 1. If we have a number to the left of negative 1, that means when we square it, it's going to be positive and multiply it, it's going to be positive. And in the denominator, if we add 1 to a number smaller than negative 1, it's still going to be negative. And if we subtract 1 from it, it's going to be negative. So we're going to end up with a positive over positive, which means to the left side of negative 1, we are going to infinity. So it's going to approach this asymptote like that. Now, these functions are kind of strange sometimes. You can't assume that on the you need to check the same way we did over here. And I can't erase just that little. So 
I'll go to a different color. Uh, no matter what the number is, if we squared it times two, is going to be two. Now in the denominator, if we add one, it's going to be positive. Um, I have two of the numerator. That's going to be which means to negative infinity. Now we also, I really didn't draw that. Um, X is another app. And one, for one thing, there's no zero in between. But I guess we hadn't found zero yet. But, and there probably was. But anyway, between zero. That I'm going but the x minus one, these are numbers when you subtract, which means it's going a little. little. You would see that the num numerator is going to be zero with it's going to go through the and then the last thing we have to check uh, if x is greater than, if x is greater than one the numerator is still X plus is going to be positive. And X minus 1, these numbers are bigger than 1. If a number bigger than 1 and you subtract 1, it's still going to be positive. So here, don't let it tie. But we're going, so we know that much about the graph just by looking at the vertical asymptotes and what's going on in the different portions of it. Um, I really don't want to erase that graph, so I'm going to try diligently to white out some of this over here. And this might take me a while. Um, does anyone have any questions on what I've just done? Well, I have I just erased the function. I guess I could have left that. Might need some space. Okay. I got a little portion of the board completed here. Um, 
Now I'm going to rewrite this too. If you remember the original function, the denominator was not a factor. So we're going to go back and look at the original function and I'll show you why. Um, especially if that's the way it was given to you, you probably have it written down anyway. It just depends on what part of the problem you go back to. And this was x squared minus 1. To find the horizontal asymptote, if there is one, you look at the power of x's. Let me make sure I get this right. If the numerator has a higher power than the denominator, there is no vertical asymptote, but there's a slant asymptote, which means it would be a line in that direction if it has a positive slope or in that direction if it has a negative slope. But there's no horizontal asymptote if the degree of the numerator is higher than the denominator. If the degree of the numerator is less or smaller than the degree of the denominator, then y zero is a horizontal asymptote. And I saved what this one is for last. If I'm trying to get color, okay. If the powers of the numerator and denominator are the same, then you look at the coefficients. And in this case, we have. 2 over 1, which simply says y equals 2 is my horizontal asymptote. So I know that's a much smaller distance than my 1 was, but because of what else I've done here, I need it lower. So this is going to be your horizontal asymptote. And over here, I still have to make a correction because now it is possible for a, hor uh, a graph to cross a horizontal asymptote. And give me just a second. I'm going to draw it in yellow because I don't want it to show up much. If if this came down, well, it didn't change to yellow. If this came down and crossed the asymptote, it could come back up and approach the asymptote even from below instead of above. So, especially with horizontal asymptotes, it gives you the end behavior. What is it doing when you're... Okay, I just erased it again by mistake. I did not mean to do that. And I don't think there's any way to bring it back. Well, I showed you what I needed to for that, but what we had, oh, we had an asymptote here at negative one and one, and we had another one up here at two. So this is two, and this was negative one, and this was one. So we knew that this was coming down. And then because of the asymptote, for right now, we're just going to assume it's going in that direction. I mean, 
we know it's going in that direction, but we're going to assume it doesn't cross the uh, asthmatope. And we had this part that was going down on both sides. And then we have another curve that looks like this. Another thing you can do is find the zeros. And of course, to find the zeros, you set the function equal to zero, or you set the numerator equal to zero. Because a function f of x, which is written as a fraction, which can be anything over anything, That equals zero only if a equals zero, only if the numerator is equal to zero. Um, the denominator can be equal to zero, and zero over anything is zero. So the numerator of this function was 2x squared. Well, if you set that equal to 0, divide by 2, the only time x squared equals 0 is if x equals 0. So that is the only um, 0. Only I have that drawn wrong. Oh, let's see if I can erase. Never mind. <laughs> oh, things aren't with me today. Real quickly, I'm going to sketch what we had. We had a part of the graph up here part of the graph over here. And what I had drawn wrong, this is my asthmatote. This part of the graph looks like this because zero was our intercept. And I had it drawn at two by mistake. So be careful about that. Um, are there any questions on that? Okay, here's here's another problem that I think we need to look at, though. Even though nobody has any questions about anything, which I guess is good, if you understand that it's all. Um, Um, x squared minus 9 over x squared minus 2x minus 3. Um, and I think maybe what I'm going to do is find all the information about this graph, and then I'll erase that because you'll all have it written down, and then we'll graph it. So let's start with the domain. And I'm going to let you do some of the work with this. To find the domain, we have to factor the denominator. So what do you get when you factor x squared minus 2x minus 3?
Come on, it shouldn't take you that long to factor that. I'm waiting for you. Well, at least there's someone out there working. Yes, this should give you x minus 3 times x plus 1, which means x equals 3 and negative 1. So your domain would be You might want to, when you write down the solutions to that, you might want to write them in numerical order to help you write interval notation. Okay, so. What do you get if you factor the numerator? This is just you and I. Um, yes, x minus 3 times x plus 3. And this is important because if you only look at the factors of the domain, you would have had two uh, vertical asymptotes. However, if you look at this, the x and you factor the numerator and the denominator, you notice that you have an x minus 3 that divides out. When you have a factor that divides out, that means there's a hole. at x equals 3. And it means there's a vertical asymptote at x equals negative 1. Okay, the x equals 3 is not a, a vertical asymptote. It's a hole, and I'll show you when we graph it exactly what that means. Um, a horizontal asymptote. Well, this is like the previous problem. Our highest power is the same. So we look at the coefficients. Well, with the coefficients, we get one of over 1, which means the horizontal asymptote is at y equals 
1. I was thinking, I think that's all we have to do for that one. We could, we could find the y-intercept. To find the y-intercept, you let x equal 0, which means um, looking at the factored form after we divide it out, we have 0 plus 3. over zero, my, 0 plus 1, which means our y-intercept is at 0, 3. 3 over 1 is 3. Um, again, we said to find the uh, uh, x-intercept, the zeros, that's what I was looking for, the zeros, which is the same as the x-intercepts. You set the numerator equal to zero because the denominator can't be zero. So that gives us zero plus three, which means It's at three. Okay, so you need to have all this written down. That was the y-intercept. Because now we're going to go ahead and graph it. I am going to write the function down. f of x was equal to x squared minus 9 over x squared minus 2x minus 3. We had a vertical asymptote at minus one. And a horizontal asymptote at one. Um, after we factored this, we ended up with x plus 3 over x plus 1. So when we're looking at the end behavior, what happens? Is it going up or down to the left of negative 1? The factored form is easier to work with. We would have negative, I'm sorry, if this is negative, well, uh, another thing that we do need to consider uh, was where the hole is. But the hole was at x equals 3. Yes, because we had x minus 3 uh, that divided out. We'll worry about that when we're on the other side. But when we're on the side, um, we, 
we also had an x-intercept or a zero at negative three. And we had a y-intercept at three. So if we want to know what's happening as we approach negative one from the left, really looking at between negative three and negative one. So between negative three and negative one, if we add three to one of those numbers, that's going to be positive. And if we add one to one of those numbers, it's going to be negative. For instance, if we, we pick negative two, Negative 2 plus 1 would be negative. So that's going to give us a negative number, which means from negative 3, we're going to negative infinity. And here, we're going to be approaching the asymptote. Now here, we need to know, are we going down or are we going up? So if we look at numbers between negative 1 and 0, between negative 1 and 0, that numerator is going to be positive. And the denominator, we're still adding 1, that's also going to be positive. So we have a positive over positive, that's going to positive infinity. And this is going to be approaching that aspect. What we didn't look at yet is we said there was a hole at three. Um, what that means, the function is not defined at three because that would put a zero in the denominator, the original denominator. So what it means is there's a place at 3, only at the number 3, that there is no point. So we show that by putting a circle there. Come on, put a circle there. Okay. I kind of exaggerated the circle because I didn't know how the pen was going to react to that. But that's how you do one of these problems. Now, they are a little more time consuming than some of the other problems that you've worked with, but it um, you find everything and are able to graph uh, rational functions that you haven't done before. Um, just to summarize for you, because I think it's very important that you hacking these problems, you know what you need to do. So to find the domain, You actually find where the denominator is equal to zero. And eliminate. Eliminate those x's. Okay. And I actually didn't write that what I said. That should be set the denominator equal to zero, and those are the numbers that you're going to eliminate.
Oh, come on. It doesn't like to change color. Okay, then, in fact, you've probably in that, you've already, write that down here, factor the denominator. And then after you've worked with that, factor the numerator. And you know, if you if you prefer, you can do the factoring all at once, that's fine. Factor the numerator and then you're gonna find the holes. because those are the common factors, common factors between the numerator and denominator. Um, to find the vertical asymptotes, you um, set the remaining factors of the denominator. equal to zero. And then define it says find. It doesn't look like it does. That's what it is. Um, to find the horizontal asymptotes. And these are the ones that are a little bit difficult to to do. Just remember them. Um, if the degree um, if the degree of the numerator is bigger than the denominator, and that's the degree of the denominator. Um, then why oh then then there's no it's greater than numerator is greater and there's no come on And when there's no horizontal asymptote, you look for a slant asymptote. And I'm not sure if you're going to do much with the slant asymptotes. If you do and you want more information about them, let me know. If the degree of the numerator equals the denominator it's it's real easy to find but it's it's difficult to write out exactly what it is it's the fraction of the coefficients Okay, you take the leading coefficient of the numerator over the denominator. 
And if the degree of the numerator is less than the denominator, then y equals 0. And that says is less than. And this is y equals the fraction of the coefficient. Um, I don't have room for it here, but you always find x and y intercepts the same way. To find an x intercept, you let y equal 0. To find a y intercept, you let x equal 0. Um, I hope this helps you. Um, as you're doing problems this week and your instructor's going over things, you really should be having some questions on these. Um, when, when I'm in a classroom situation, usually by this time of the semester, I have trouble getting around to all the students that have questions on the days that we do individual questions. So I really think some of you should be having some questions please don't hesitate to ask. It makes it a lot easier for me if I don't have to figure out what to teach. If you're asking questions, I'll just answer questions. And if you come across a problem that you're having difficulty with, let me know. Um, I said it at the beginning of class, and some of you weren't here yet, I don't think. Um, I have made a video for the solutions to last Wednesday's quiz. I haven't graded your quiz yet, um, but I hope to get that video posted today. Um, you could look it up online, but it'd probably be easier to wait till I post it. Okay, I will see you on Wednesday then.